Jeffrey Sterling was an unwanted spy. He blew the whistle on the CIA twice, first on their practices of racial discrimination, and then on a covert operation he felt was so flawed it endangered U.S. security. And as a result, over the course of two separate presidential administrations, the CIA, the FBI, and the Department of Justice came after Sterling with a vengeance. I am Chip Gibbons, and this is the Primary Sources Podcast. Primary Sources is a limited series podcast presented by Defending Rights in Dissent. At Defending Rights in Dissent, one of our top concerns has been the use of the Draconian Espionage Act against whistleblowers. In the last two episodes, we explored the history of the Espionage Act as a means of repressing dissent and controlling information. We also got a broad overview of its role in the current war on whistleblowers. Today marks the first in a series of episodes giving you an in-depth look at what whistleblowers charged under the Espionage Act face. We do that by bringing you directly the voice of those who have, been, those who have faced prosecution under the Espionage Act. In a moment, I'll present our first of such guest, Jeffrey Sterling. But first, I also want to invite you to visit us on the web at primarysourcespodcast.org and consider subscribing and rating us at wherever it is you listen to podcasts. More breaking news now, stunning allegations from a whistleblower at the Department of Homeland Security. A whistleblower complaint involving President Trump. What are we doing violating the Constitution? I knew that if I remained silent, that I be complicit in a crime. Jeffrey Sterling has been found guilty on all nine counts he was facing. A former CIA officer convicted of passing secret information on Iran's nuclear program to a reporter has been sentenced to three and a half years. Our guest today is Jeffrey Sterling, a former CIA case officer who would go on to sue the CIA for racial discrimination. In 2015, Sterling became another victim in the U.S. government's war on whistleblowers when he was convicted under the Espionage Act. Just in this hour, a former CIA officer convicted of passing secret information on Iran's nuclear program. Jeffrey Sterling of O'Fallon, Missouri is a former CIA officer. Jeffrey Sterling began his CIA career in 1993. Jeffrey Sterling has been found guilty on all nine counts he was facing. Only circumstantial evidence was presented during the trial and Sterling continues to maintain his innocence. Sterling is the author of Unwanted Spy, The Persecution of an American Whistleblower. Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. So I, I was reading your book in in preparing for this interview, and I was struck by the fact that you um, begin with an excerpt from a poem by Langston Hughes, uh, Langston Hughes's America. What drew you to that passage, and why did you choose to include it in a book called Unwanted Spy? Many people might not uh, immediately think of think of Langston Hughes when they're thinking of the memoirs of our CIA case officer. Well, I've always been struck by the poetry of Langston Hughes, uh, always sort of hit home with me, uh, especially the poems that talked about America and that poem in particular. What it was saying was that, you know, I may be black, but I'm also American. I'm, I'm part of the same America that you uh, cherish and love. Uh, the only difference being the color of my skin. And I thought that was an appropriate start for my book because the book really does tell of a journey of trying to figure out uh, and going through where do I fit? Do I fit where I want to in this America or do I fit where America tells me to fit? And uh, the, the journey for me was going where I felt like I wanted to be as long as I was myself. Um, and so therefore that, that poem from Langston Hughes, uh, just really struck home with me. It, 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 it's like the underlying theme to my book. So how did you come to work at the CIA? Well, interesting backstory on that. I was uh, finishing my last year of law school. And uh, as any you know, pending graduate, I'm trying to figure out what my next steps are going to be. I've done other interviews at law firms and things like that. But I came across an ad in the paper. Uh, to join the CIA. It wasn't a hidden ad or anything. 
I flat out said, join the CIA, travel the world. And I was very intrigued by that. International relations, international law was always a passion of mine and an interest. So I said, hey, why not? Uh, it would uh, help me get out there, be a part of the world, and also feel like I could make a contribution to my country. Um, so I decided to answer the ad, and um, a good while afterwards, I was a part of the CIA. It's funny you mentioned the ad was not in any way hidden. A, a few years back, I was listening to uh, Spotify. This was before I I paid for the premium version because all my friends made fun of me for being too cheap to pay for Spotify premium. So I, I finally gave in and I, 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 I got an ad for like CIA clandestine services, right? It was like, you know, come be a clandestine officer. And I followed the URL just out of, out of curiosity. And it's like, you can't mention to anyone you're applying for this, but we're, we're advertising on, on Spotify. So the yes. uh, degree of openness with which they advertise the clandestine services is sort of um, interesting. Uh, so in your book, you talk about the culture at the agency. You start in the early Clinton years, I believe. And you say that at times, I think you say this, at times you felt like your coworkers had discovered a new religion in which Ronald Reagan was God. Um, yes. Can you talk about some of your initial reactions to the agency and the culture? Uh, my reaction to that was sort of shock um, as how can a government agency tasked with serving this country, protecting this country, uh, and serving its intelligence needs. How can individuals who work there have such a reverence for a previous administration, uh, you know, to the point of trying to disregard the current administration? Um, to me, it was more of a service to an individual and an ideology as opposed to service to the country. Um, which should be, which should have no ideology, which should be uh, objective, if you will, uh, and to meet the needs of whatever administration is coming, with, not to have the, the strings tied tightly to a previous ideology. And with, with Reagan, I, I thought that was uh, a specific ideology uh, that I was really surprised an organization like the CIA would have. Um, and Again, it was shocking to me. And in some ways, it wasn't surprising. Um, again, we're dealing with a bureaucracy, individuals who had been around for in their jobs for many, many years. Uh, but that was maybe sort of the uh, introduction for me to the conservative nature uh, of the CIA, which was actually a bit counter to what my ideas of the CIA were and should have been. So on this note, very early during your time at the CIA, another employee, uh, you call him Henderson in your book, obviously that's a, a pseudonym, uh, yes. a, a black agent who, or a black officer who has a PhD, he takes you aside and sort of asks you what you're doing at the agency. Could you tell us a little bit about what this individual said to you and, and your, your reactions to it? Uh, yes, I've been uh, at the agency for a couple of months, I believe, at this time. Um, slowly getting to know people, make my way around uh, the organization. And a, a Black uh, employee officer uh, came up to me one day in the cafeteria, just sitting down and having a chat. And he sort of abruptly said to me, you know, why are you here? And this is after I let him know what my background was um, and my interest in this. And he just, that was shocking for me. I mean, asking me why I was there. I actually took a little offense to that uh, because to me, it's like, well, you are here. Uh, did someone not ask you the same question? Uh, but his point was, why are you here when you can make such a contribution somewhere else? And why are you here in a place that isn't going to accept you for your capabilities, but it's always going to uh, view you uh, by the color of your skin? Um, again, I, I took a bit of offense to that, uh, mainly because, again, he was there. He was a black officer. He was in the CIA. Why couldn't I serve in the CIA as well? Uh, it was hard for me, though I kept it in the back of my mind, that he was essentially warning me about what was coming or what could potentially come being a part of the CIA. Um, it, was, uh, it was like my second introduction uh, to the agency. 
which had a later uh, absolutely profound effect on me. But it was a it was a very striking beginning for me. Uh, I, 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 I mean, he says something to the effect of the CIA is one of the only places I know where a white man with a high school diploma will go farther than a black man with a PhD. I mean, that's a pretty absolutely. pretty uh, yeah. Dark that was hard for me to yeah yeah i uh, government federal government agency uh how could that happen uh in this day and age uh, but of course that was me being positive and and hopeful uh for being accepted in the cia and treated as an equal um again that was essentially a warning to me uh, of, of what was coming uh and once I settled down from the sort of shock of what he asked me why I was there, um, I've been calm, you know, more calm mindset, uh, realized what he was saying and that he was, he was uh, in a way being protective of me and sort of telling, you know, looking out for my interests, if you will, uh, in an in a indirect way. Uh, but uh, it was a very profound, and to know that someone with a high school education could go farther in an organization uh, than someone with a, with a, a law degree um, actually was the sort of thing that I did learn firsthand. And when you're out in, in the field, I believe in, in Africa, you meet one of the few black case officers besides yourself, and he has similar words for you, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, he does. And, uh, it, so it, it, there's this thing that's starting. Um, and I also noticed it in the different areas that I worked in the agency. Many times I would be the only uh, black officer working in whatever particular office I was in. Um, and to me, you know, like, I, I try not to make a big deal out of that because to me, it's like you get where you are based on your capabilities, the character of, of you know, your character, um, your capabilities. Uh, so I knew maybe with uh, rose colored glasses on that I knew I was going to be accepted. I, I knew uh, and was counting on and I was working hard to be accepted. Uh, but there was a continual thing that I was that other one uh, sort of thing. Uh, I think I mentioned in the book is one aspect that secretaries will get uh, appreciation awards for the hard work they did. Yet in the same office, you know, I would come in weekends, work late routinely, um, but never recognized uh, for any of the work that I did. Uh, privately, with the door closed, uh, offered appreciation, uh, as if not to let anyone else know that here we are let, you know, talking or accepting, uh, congratulating this uh, different officer. Um, but it was a continual thing for me through the agency. So you end up suing the CIA for racial discrimination. Absolutely. What led you to file that lawsuit? Well, again, that thing was continuing. And as I was in the field, uh, you know, as a, based in whatever location in the world, I was not receiving the same tools that officers lower than me and on my level were receiving in assistance to, to do their jobs. Uh, and one, aspect uh, in one posting I noted in the book that you know the head of the office told me that I was only there to do one thing and that made absolutely no sense to me that was a surprise to me and uh, I said well where are you getting that information and his reply was that's what headquarters pretty much ordered of how I was to be treated and that was shocking to me that that made absolutely no sense because as an officer at the beginning of your career having only one thing to do, essentially one operation to do, uh, is not career enhancing at all. Uh, and so, but I was then also expected to do the same, if not more amount of work as the officers who were receiving the proper tools and support. Uh, and that continued and it just reached to a point when I was in New York that I had had enough. Um, I continually asked for support. I continually requested to have the same tools as other officers, yet um, I, the answer was always the same. Uh, you're given the same thing as everyone else. And I said, well, show me. 
uh, a good example. I don't want to go around too much. Um, when I was based in New York, uh, there's a prime target there. I think you can imagine what that prime target is. Uh, and I wasn't given any tools, any credentials uh, to go or to be in that environment in order to uh, recruit individuals to give us uh, intelligence information. Um, my credentials were a little more than an army logistics officer, which is pretty much uh, a fancy way of saying on my card that I was a janitor. Mm -hmm. And I would continue, and I and even despite that, I, I had successes in, in things that I came up with on my own, um, you know, contacts on my own, gathering information on my own, yet I would say to them, imagine what I could do if I was given the same tools that every other officer in this office is given. And of course, in that office, I was uh, the only a black face, uh, yet they refused uh, and never had an adequate reason as to why. They would say, well, other officers in your position are doing much better than you. And I, my response to that was, I would ask who? Because I was the only one there with, that was treated differently. Of course, they would never answer that question. Um, and I had had enough while I was there in New York. And I, it, it was really tough for me to do that. I'd gone through years of trying to fight this system, uh, this employer that only saw me in one way. Not that I was capable, not that I was intelligent enough, uh, but that I was a security risk. And early on in my career, I was told that I was essentially a security risk because I stuck out as a big, big black guy speaking Farsi, which again, made absolutely no sense. I had traveled the world and no place that I'd ever been had anyone suspected me of being with the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, yet none of that mattered uh, to the CIA. To them, I was black and not a part of them, not a part of that family, if you will, uh, and I was just uh, essentially a number to show for uh, diversity, if you will. What happens to your lawsuit? Well, I, I filed uh, on my own, uh, filed in the uh, lawsuit in New York. Um, the CIA and the Department of Justice immediately moved to have the suit thrown out or not allowed to go forward because of concerns for national security. Um, the New York federal court disagreed with that and allowed the, the suit to go forward. Yet the Department of Justice and the agency were allowed to venue shop. So they were able to change the venue, change the location of the trial that I was intent on having. And it was moved to the, uh, to the fourth district, uh, Eastern district of Virginia. Uh, and immediately that court, which is in the backyard of the CIA and is essentially known as the you know, staunch supporter of the CIA and the government in general, uh, immediately uh, granted the government's motion to uh, stop the case because it posed a threat to national security. Yeah. Eastern uh, Districts of Virginia is their, their favorite, and we're going to come back to them with the second part of this interview but um but yeah so and was, you're uh, as i say it was a shock to me uh, that in this country uh, and it's still hard for me to even say that a black man standing up for his civil rights is a threat to the national security of this country um again it was one of those instances of shock but also of a very difficult uh, acceptance that, you know what, that does happen here, and it will continue, and it, and it continues to happen here in this country. So you're ultimately severed ways with with the CIA. You're you're, you're terminated, um, yes. and you, you try to write a memoir, which results in a second lawsuit against the CIA. This time for sort of blocking your censoring your memoir during pre-publication yeah. review. What was that suit about and what happened to this suit as well as this memoir? Okay. Uh, during my, uh, I was essentially uh, 
leading up to actually being fired, I was persona non grata at the agency. I was set in a closet, a uh, supply closet um, during the day uh, until they ultimately didn't want me even coming into any of the buildings. Um, you know, of course, during that time, I was trying to find other positions to find to go in the agency, but no one would accept me. Uh, so I'm out all of it, you know, for years, I went into the, of course, I went into the agency undercover. And now I'm suddenly thrust out into the real world, if you will. Um, and it was completely foreign to me. And it was a really difficult time. I, I decided to write a book. Uh, about my experience. Uh, if anything, it may have been a good uh, emotional release for me. Um, so I, I'm going through the process of writing a book. I knew that I had to get approval from the publications review board uh, for anything that I was writing. I had no intention of divulging any classified information. Yet, as I'm submitting the information, they're wanting me to make changes that I could not agree with. And I can understand asking someone to uh, leave a section out or uh, blank out, redact, if you will, certain parts of my story. They wanted me to change the story. They wanted, they were giving me affirmative steps that they wanted taken in my book, primary of which they didn't want me to say that I lived in New York uh, or that my, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. They, did not want me to say that I worked in New York, even though that's where I lived uh, during the segment of my book. And what they wanted me to say was that my more my regular morning meetings with the office staff were in Washington, D.C. So every day they wanted me to say that I traveled down to D.C. for my staff meetings and then went back to where I lived in New York. They didn't want any ties to New York in any way, shape or form. That's quite the connection. I, absolutely. And that, and it was a lie. Um, I was not going to lie about anything in, in a story about my life. And I took issue with that. They didn't, they, of course, the agency being who they are, they don't have to relent to anyone. So they refused and I, I, I sued. Um, and we were going through that process. Um, and all of a sudden I was fired. I lost everything. I was broke and I could not continue with the suit. I, I couldn't pay any attorneys to do that. And at the time also, I really didn't have a place to live. I lost my apartment, my car. Uh, I had returned home um, basically penniless. And uh, that suit, I, I could not go forward with that. They had. Uh, worn me down through the other. And um, unfortunately, that suit uh, did not progress. So with my next question, I realize there's still a lot of things you, you cannot tell us about this topic, but some of them are public because of your trial and the book you did publish. Um, what was Operation Merlin to the extent that you're allowed to speak about it? No, I, actually, I'm freely allowed to speak about it. Most okay. of details of the operation were divulged during the trial. But Operation Merlin was designed to uh, thwart or interrupt the Iranian nuclear program, uh, their efforts to gain nuclear weapon. And what the idea of the operation was to instill into their program plans for uh, a component of a nuclear weapon, a key component of a nuclear weapon and the thought being that they would implement this, these plans, unbeknownst to them that the plans were flawed and they would not be able to detect the flaw. So if they built off of the plans, it would result in a weapon that would not work and they wouldn't be able to figure out how to do it. Um, my role was to recruit an individual to place those plans with the Iranians, approach them with a the idea of selling uh, some key nuclear information. Uh, I was working with a Russian uh, uh, and former scientist within the Russian nuclear program and trained him on how to approach Iranians, which ways, uh, which methodologies to find out the right Iranians we would want to help instill this into the program. Um, it was very difficult working with that individual, but I successfully had him trained. Uh, 
uh, we were on the point of launching the operation because we did have a contact. We did have someone key within the program uh, who would be the perfect conduit uh, to relay their plans to. We are close to launching the operation uh, at some final meetings before having the uh, Russian travel to hand over the plans. And this was the first time that he was going to see the plans. Now, this guy is a scientist, uh, a nuclear scientist, and I was assured that even he would not be able to detect the flaw in these plans for this component. Almost immediate after he was able to finally take a look at the plans, he noticed that they were flawed, that they would not work. And that set off all sorts of bells and whistles to me in that if he could immediately notice that these plans are flawed, why wouldn't the Iranians in the nature of science is, okay, if you see something that's broken, you're gonna do what you can to fix it. So instead of thwarting their program, because if they detect, again, the flaw, they're going to fix it. So instead of thwarting their program, we could be potentially advancing their program and they would get a have a nuclear weapon far sooner than anyone expected uh, i raised my concerns during that meeting i raised my concerns with individuals at headquarters uh, any and everyone i could talk to about it and essentially i was stonewalled and basically told uh, to be quiet uh, everything was all right uh, essentially saying to me what do i know um, I'm just, you know, this black officer who they've allowed to be part of this plant, uh, operation. And again, I was the only black face involved in the operation. So I was pretty much, uh, shut out from any more dealings with that operation. And that was also part of the, in the continued pressure on me. Uh, it's funny after that meeting and after my raising of concerns, the requirements of me at my at that posting became higher and higher and higher. Uh, impossible uh, tasking to accomplish without the proper tools. And um, that's what started my process with the, the lawsuit. So you have concerns about Operation Merlin. What do you do if those concerns ultimately, where do you take them? Well, I, I was banished from that current posting back to the DC area, and I still had concerns. I went to the House Intelligence Committee uh, initially. Uh, it was to discuss my discrimination claims, but I also talked about my concerns with Operation Merlin. Um, there is a process that individuals in the intelligence community are allowed to use to raise concerns. Uh, outside of your working organization. Um, so I raised, again, the discrimination concerns and also the concerns of this operation. Uh, time passed. Uh, and then I eventually made it, uh, wrote, raised this, this, uh, the operation concerns to the Senate Intelligence Committee. Um, and at every point, especially with the Senate Intelligence Committee, I told them my concerns. I gave them minute details of the operation and, and said, look, you can do with this what you want. And when I went to the Senate Intelligence Committee, that was shortly after we launched into Iraq. So my concern was, one of the direct concerns I had was that the possibility of if, if they had continued to launch the operation, who else may have gotten those plans? If it worked for one country, maybe it could work for another. Uh, as I was on my way out of that operation, of course, it was be, it was being it was successful, it was working, and I the the talk was that hey, if this works against one eye, maybe it'll work against another eye. Meaning it was directed at Iran, so maybe the next place it could work would be Iraq. So if Iraq had these plans, implemented them into a weapon of mass destruction, I mean, the talk a lot during that time were dirty bombs. And that's exactly what they could have developed. Uh, and our troops would have been going into a situation not knowing the enormity and the danger that they were facing. 
um, I expressed all of those concerns to the Senate Intelligence Committee. I said I didn't want anything. I wasn't there to talk about my discrimination suit, which was pending at the time. I was expressing my concerns as an American, as, a, as an employee of the CIA, and as someone generally concerned. Um, and as I found out during the trial, uh, they did not put that information. So James Risen is currently at The Intercept, but during the time we're talking about, he's at the New York Times. He wrote an article about your racial discrimination case when it was yes. going on. In 2006, he publishes a book in entirely unrelated to that called State of War, The Secret History of the CIA and the Bush Administration. Uh, how did you first become aware he published this book? I became aware of that uh, when the CIA showed up at my doorstep uh, years later uh, when I was living in the St. Louis area. Uh, the CIA, I had come home from work. I had, you know, I had lost everything, but I built myself back up and I was um, you know, starting again. Um, then one day the FBI shows up and they tell me about the book. I had no idea at that point that a book had been published. And they were expressing concern to me and they showed me a picture of someone who looked of Middle Eastern descent saying that they were concerned about me because this is someone that they had chattered that was, going, was targeting me. Um, I recognized that ruse uh, immediately, um, that they were just trying to get in my favor, things like that. And I said, absolutely. You know, I, I have no idea about the book. I had no idea it was published or what any concerns are. You know, please leave my, leave my driveway. Um, and that's when you know, a lot of the uh, other uh, unfortunate uh, instances started happening. So, so they're, they're accusing you of being one of the sources for the book because it mentions Operation Merlin. My understanding is that's not a, a major part of the book, but it is, it is mentioned in it. Had you any idea before this the FBI was pursuing you as a potential whistleblower? Uh, no, no. For me, um, the only thing I had going on with the government was that I had gone to the Senate Intelligence Committee, told them my concerns. I still had my discrimination suit going, which, of course, taken was taking a lot of time and they just all of a sudden i had no idea what was going on that i was being investigated that there was a grand jury or anything like that and um because at this point i was appealing the dismissal by the fourth circuit so waiting on that and all of a sudden here they show up at my doorstep i, I thought i had let all of that moved away from any concerns about uh, my integrity or anything like that with the, with the CIA, but here it was. And it, it, uh, it, it was quite shocking. And it I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, no, let me cut you off. It, it escalates rather quickly, right? They execute a search warrant on your home in 2006. Yes. And you're under all and the- it was, it was incredible. I thought I was going to lose my job at that time, but incredibly, uh, I did not um, because they uh, confiscated uh, a work laptop. And so, you know, myself being part of the legal profession, I realized, okay, an indictment, an arrest usually follows um, a search warrant. Um, yet none came. Uh, there were years passed almost and then almost five years after that search warrant, um, I was indicted and arrested. What year did they finally indict you? I believe it's always kind of murky. It was late 2010 uh, that I was indicted and I was arrested in early January, 2011. When you're arrested, the FBI gets you to come into your workplace under false pretenses. Absolutely. And they actually um, have reporters who they've tipped off. Or although, yes. Go on. Yeah, my, uh, I was a fraud investigator uh, for a uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield plan. Uh, actually, uh, it was called WellPoint at that time and eventually Anthem. Um, and my direct supervisor was a former FBI agent, uh, field agent. And her supervisor was a former uh, 
U.S. attorney. Of course, when I got the job, I didn't think anything about that at the time. I had no animosity at that time towards any of the agencies or other than the CIA, I guess you will. Um, and I didn't think anything of it. Late 2010, after I'd been working at the insurance company for quite a while, seven, eight years, and quite successful at the job, um, I underwent uh, knee replacement surgery. So I was off work for a good while. Uh, I had left my supervisor, and at that time, she was based in Atlanta while I was in uh, St. Louis. And so I'm home recuperating from knee replacement surgery. Um, and I had scheduled to come back to the office in early January, actually a week after I was arrested. Well, one day, uh, further along in my uh, recuperation, uh, my supervisor called and asked if I was able to uh, make a meeting down at the office because we we're gonna talk about some fraud initiatives with the pharmacy benefit manager. I was in charge of uh, most pharmacy fraud across all of uh, Anthem at that time. And I was itching to get back to work. So I said, sure, I, I, can, I can, she asked if I was able to drive. And I said, yeah, I'm walking with a cane, but I can drive just fine. I get, make it down to the meeting um, there she is, we have a meeting and I'm really anxious to go figure out what's going on with the fraud investigations. And when are we going to go speak with the pharmacy benefit manager? And she keeps putting me off. And then all of a sudden she says, well, let, let's go to lunch. She was going to take the office out to lunch. And I said, okay. And she said, we will go up to the pharmacy benefit manager after lunch. Um, I get a call, I'm at my desk sorting through the piles that were there from the time that I was away from work. And I get a call from our security uh, office saying that there was an issue with my badge and could I please come up front? I did. And as I stepped up to the security kiosk there at the, at the entrance, uh, the FBI was there waiting for me uh, to arrest me. And the FBI so, is had tipped the media off. So there are reporters outside. I believe so. This was a show for them, uh, a, a big show. And even one of the local news outlets, uh, because I was limping as I came out, uh, speculated that there was a scuffle uh, as I was being arrested. Uh, just incredible. Wow. So this was a tremendous show for the FBI. Uh, and the insurance company who they, yes, they did set me, I was set up to be arrested. And what's disgusting about the entire thing is that the whole world knew exactly where I was at that time. I was home recovering from knee replacement surgery. Uh, there was no need for grandstanding the way they did. So in your book, you talk about when you're preparing for the trial itself, and you, you eventually come to this realization that in your words, you realize the trial was going to have only one focus, the battle between a black nonconformist and the American way represented by the agency that is, that is the CIA. Explain what you meant by this. This was more so, and the, the trial became essentially uh, an aesthetic uh, and touching upon every stereotype that you could think of. Uh, put there before the jury. This, this was a trial not of any proof that this individual broke the law, but this was a trial that this is a guy, a black man who just can't come along with the rest of us. And this is what he did. And this is why he's back. And we don't really need to show why he's not a good person with any evidence. All we need to do is show and point to him and show you from the witnesses that we bring up from the agency that he doesn't look like anyone else there. Uh, so he's not to be trusted, that uh, sort of thing. So it, it, it was a show trial. It was a trial for the chance for the CIA to show how uh, noble it was. And it was easy to point me out as I have discussed and pointed out that the only thing proven beyond a reasonable doubt during that trial was that I was black. 
And that's all the prosecution needed for that jury. So let's talk, what is the government's case against you look like? Their first instance is the fact that Ryzen had written and had written that article about my discrimination suit and he's subsequently the one who wrote the book. Uh, their view was that I was angry at the agency so I turned this information over. Um, so guilt by uh, association, if you will. Uh, but interestingly enough, during the trial, one of the individuals that I spoke to, one of the staffers I spoke to at the Senate Intelligence Committee, after my meeting with her and another staffer, when I was raising concerns about Operation Merlin, she was subsequently fired from the Senate Intelligence Committee for leaking classified information. And shockingly enough, she was accused of leaking classified information to James Rising. Yet the focus stayed on me. There was no, that meant nothing to the judge, the jury, certainly the prosecutors. Uh, that was just an aside. Uh, that meant nothing. And that, that was incredible because the whole time we're like, what is this trial about? They're not proving anything. They're not even establishing anything other than their own racial biases. And you have direct testimony from someone who was fired for doing exactly what they were accusing me of, yet she was never investigated. No one else was investigated the whole time other than me. And that, that was uh, just absolutely astounding to me. I had gone to law school. I knew how trials were supposed to work. Um, and that was further evidence that there is a criminal justice system that applies to white Americans and there's a criminal justice system that applies to black Americans. I was absolutely sitting in the criminal justice system for black Americans. So just for the benefit of people listening, let me just recap all of this. They have no evidence you gave classified information to anyone. They do have evidence you talked to James Risen, who wrote a story about your lawsuit at a time when it was a major national news story being covered by CNN, et cetera, and other places as well. And they know of the existence of another person who had information about the same thing you were accused of leaking information about, who allegedly gave information to the reporter in question. Is that is that a correct summary? Yes, and supposedly the information that she divulged to Verizon wasn't related to uh, Operation Merlin, but the connection is still there. <laughs> so, it's reasonable doubt if I ever heard it. I mean, like yeah. I would probably never be on your jury because of my my feelings about this issue. Uh, but if I was sitting there listening to that, I uh, I don't think I could. I would not return. I would not return a conviction like that. Is like one of the strongest cases for reasonable doubt I have ever heard. Um, it is shocking, mm. but you are convicted. Uh, and yes, absolutely. Uh, just a word about the jury that did come up with that conviction. Um, that juror was pulled out of the uh, Eastern District of Virginia, which essentially everyone in the jury pool had some sort of relation to uh, security clearances uh, mm. or some connection with the intelligence community. Uh, so that was a jury in itself that was going to be biased towards uh, favoring with the government and you know, probably out of fear of, uh, you know, I've got a security clearance or I know someone with it, uh, I better fall in line. And this is how they fall in line with that. So it sorry, was also, to <laughs> I thought that just needed to be. No, uh, no, no. Hard, and it but. was also an all white jury, right? Um, there was no, uh, Black yeah. faces okay. on the jury. Okay. Um, majority were white. Um, and then there was a couple other people of color. I mean, part of the jury. The Eastern District of Virginia is notorious for these types of cases and these types of trials. It's why the intelligence community always venue shops. Uh, I've Absolutely. long been aware of the problems with the Eastern District, but one of the things that really struck me while reading your book is that they put Condoleezza Rice on the stand. And once again, I think it's very unlikely I would have made it onto your jury. Uh, but if I'm sitting there in the jury box and they bring Condoleezza Rice on the stand, the only thing I would be able to think about is, you know, 
do not let the smoking gun come in the form of a mushroom cloud. Here is someone who is p- part of a group of government officials who notoriously lied to the public about intelligence in order to start a, a, a war. And they're putting her on the stand and expect me to find her to have veracity, right? Like, I'm not sure there's many other places Condoleezza Rice could have gone after being a highly visible figure for the uh, propaganda campaign that led to one of the biggest disasters of US foreign policy, probably the biggest disaster in the 20th century, and have anyone, anyone take her seriously. I mean, it is just, but as you point out in your book, the jury was super impressed to have this sort of celebrity of the national security state there. Absolutely. And that was the only time during the trial that the gallery was full. Um, There were all sorts of government employees that were eager to see uh, Condoleezza Rice on on the stand. And I think the the reason the Department of Justice put her on the stand was twofold, uh, or essentially around the same issue. It was to give credibility to their position because, oh, here's this lofty person coming in to testify on behalf of the government. The other was to show the jury of what a respectable Black person looks like. Uh, Let's put this, uh, because no one else uh, called by uh, the prosecution uh, was Black. Uh, Excuse me, on one point, there was one individual that was called uh, to talk about data. for the uh, CIA with regard to employment. Uh, That person was black, but of course she didn't even work there uh, when I was at the agency. Uh, But here we have Condoleezza Rice uh, for that uh, prosecution and for that jury, and also for the smitten judge, uh, Brinkema. Here's an upstanding black citizen uh, to compare against this black man sitting in the defendant's seat. Uh, she added absolutely nothing to the prosecution's case. Uh, as a matter of fact, she made several gaffes, which could have resulted in a mistrial. Uh, yet again, of course, that court ignored it, uh, but she served her job. Um, she was the quintessential good Black person, uh, juxtaposed against uh, the, you know, the bad Black person. And I, I just want to stress again the massive amount of time that has elapsed over here, right? I think it's 2000 or 2001, you leave the CIA. It's 2003, you go to the Senate Intelligence Committee. It's 2006, uh, State of War comes out and the FBI starts harassing you, searching your home, questioning you. 2010, you're indicted. And then 2015, you're con- it. That's a very long, long trial or long, not trial, long, long legal ordeal um, over two presidential administrations. And why do you think the Obama administration, this was obviously started as, as a Bush era persecution, mm-hmm. and I, I believe they may have closed it. Why do you think the Obama administration uh, carried on with this or brought it back with whatever they did? I think the thing that people forget about with regard to presidents, it's not the promises they make that usually cause the most waves, but it's those things, those policy decisions that they do, um, which has a more of an impact than anything they promise. I I think that administration came in um, to fight a war against leaking in Washington. Every politician talks about it. Um, but they don't even look in their own backyards with regard to it. It's always the lower levels or someone else uh, that they target. And I think for, especially in my case, for Obama and Eric Holder, uh, I was a prime target for them. The, as was discussed and revealed during the trial, the FBI had dropped all of the investigation against me because in their own words, it didn't make any sense for me and this is their viewpoint, didn't make any sense for me to divulge that information, to leak that information when I had my discrimination suit was still going on at the time. So they dropped it. Uh, The Obama administration comes in and all of a sudden it's uh, brought up anew. 
uh, there was no additional evidence that was found. Uh, but I think it was easy to make that decision to go forward for the administ that administration uh, because one, it was going to be easy. Here's a black man against the CIA. Uh, how easy is that going to be? He filed a uh, suit against them. Nobody's going to believe him. They're going to think he's just a disgruntled employee who couldn't uh, pull his own while he was there. Uh, who's going to believe anything that he has to say? And I think also it was an image uh, aspect for the Obama administration to show that they were not going to kowtow to other black faces, uh, that they are going to be equal to show their, their equality, uh, their view of you know, equalness for individuals in this country, that they're not going to show any favoritism. Uh, you know, a black uh, attorney general and a black president weren't going to show any favoritism to a black citizen. Uh, so, and I think it was a spark to the overall effort to gain momentum to go after whistleblowers and in, uh, to silence dissent. And in this case, they are extraordinarily zealous. I mean, they almost in jail James Risen to try to get him to, to yep. give up his source. Um, and I know that um, Risen's stand was very heroic, but that has at times sort of overshadowed your own part of the case, which is... Yep unfortunate but i mean it is it is a, a shocking prosecution just on every level um one of the things that really struck me when i'm reading unwanted spies there's this passage near the end where you talk about how you were first really uh uncomfortable with the media term pinning the term whistleblower on you obviously based on the subtitle of your book persecution of American whistleblower, you've, you've come around and, and you talk about that some in your book. Can you explain what about the label whistleblower made you uneasy and why did you come to accept it? It made me uneasy because it was hard for me to accept that I was a whistleblower because whistleblowers, individuals are supposed to do, you're, they're doing the right thing. How could I be sitting in prison and consider myself a whistleblower? I mean, how can you do the right thing and then be punished for it? It was hard for me also because the overall connotation of whistleblower historically is as someone who leaked information uh, inappropriately. Well, I had gone through proper channels. Uh, I was, it, it was hard for me to accept that I raised issues twice. I was a whistleblower in two instances. I was trying to blow the whistle about racial discrimination at the CIA. And I was blowing the whistle to raise concerns about a faulty, uh, misguided operation, a potentially dangerous operation. But it was hard for me to look myself in the mirror and say, I am a whistleblower. But that aspect that I was trying to do the right thing really sunk in. I was putting more belief and faith in that. It didn't matter what avenue that I took, even though I did take the proper avenues that I was allowed to. I was trying to stand up to uh, you know, abuse of power, if you will, and uh, do the right thing. Uh, so it did take a while for me to process through all of that. And it's really difficult to process through anything when you're sitting and you know, on your way to and sitting in prison. Uh, but I did finally accept that, that yes, I, I am a whistleblower. And if anything, I, I'm a, the example of what happens uh, to whistleblowers in this country. What has your life been like since your conviction? Um, it's been quite uh, a challenge. Um, I've yet, you know, it's the, I was released uh, in 2018, uh, finally off of supervision in 2019. And it's been a uh, continual challenge uh, trying to find work. Uh, you know, having to check the box is almost a guarantee of an immediate um, a rejection letter. Um, but I've, I've been fortunate. I, I've been able to my wife, Holly, who has been a staunch supporter with me, for me throughout, uh, is still you know, by my side. We're, we're still the team that we were before. And 
but just trying to find my place, regain a place in society has been quite difficult. Um, I took a, of course, you know, as you noted, the, few, you know, the length of time this entire ordeal was taken. Um, you know, I was essentially broke uh, for a while, but there was people who were supportive and you know, helped me and my wife get through all of this. Uh, but trying to find that place again in society uh, has been quite difficult, uh, but you know, I have to keep trying. You've also been very outspoken about some of the other Espionage Act prosecutions, including Julian Assange, Daniel Hale. Why do you feel compelled to speak out in those cases? I, I feel that I have a duty to speak out about those because I've gone through exactly what these individuals are facing or what they are also going through. I really, you know, it, it, it's difficult for me uh, in, in, one, in one aspect, because I feel sort of responsible, if you will, for the continued actions against Julian Assange or even against Daniel Hale, just in the instance that had I been successful in my trial, maybe that would have taken the steam out of this overall witch hunter, uh, whistleblower witch hunt uh, that would have shown the faultiness uh, the one-sidedness of uh, these efforts against whistleblowers. Had I been successful, maybe they would have stopped uh, or, or things like that. But then I really come to the realization that it was an impossible situation for me to come out victorious um, against impossible odds, but I still had to stand up for it. And I feel like I need to continue to stand up against the use of the Espionage Act and this witch hunt against uh, whistleblowers, uh, because I've been there. I, I, I've had my life ruined because of it. I know the, the, what they're going to be going through if any of them decide to go through trial. Um, I think this is something that people should know about, you know, that's happening in the, uh, you know, the dark recesses of our government and our justice system. Um, so I, I feel like I have a voice based on my experiences. And I do feel a duty to uh, express myself and let people know the truth. Because in the end, that, that's what this is all about, uh, truth. And that's something, especially with regard to me, uh, Chelsea Manning, a reality winner, uh, Julian Assange, uh, truth seems to be an afterthought, if, any, if a thought at all. So you started your book with Langston Hughes and you end with one of one of my favorite authors, uh, James Baldwin, uh, mm -hmm. quoting him as saying, a journey is called that because you cannot know what you will discover on the jury, what you will do with what you find, or what you or what you find will do with, with, to you. Uh, and as you say, after that, it's been a hell of a journey. I think that is a bit of an understatement. I appreciate you coming on today. And I hope we have done some justice to your journey. Right. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate this.